you're the furthest one back. Can you hear me okay? And Fernando, you're not getting blown out over there? All right, sounds good. Well, welcome everybody. This is our first Fire Focus event. I'm really excited for these uh, specifically because we've been trying to put these together for quite a while. Um, I know we tried to start them last month, but we finally got going on them. So uh, how these kind of came about um, it was like an evolution of the old mentor program for those of you that have been around for a while um, with kind of a mix of people always thought it would be a good idea to focus on individual topics uh, every single month. But the, uh, that became more difficult uh, a long time ago. But now that we have the clubhouse, we can actually do it. So uh, this first week is gonna be focused on rentals. Uh, next week will be Evan, who's standing up right there, and Jim Keller will be focusing on wholesaling and flipping. And then Mr. Goodwin E, who's here right now, raise your hand. And uh, Andy Teasley, who was not here, but he'll be here tomorrow for exchangers if you don't know who Andy is. Uh, we'll be running it on the third Wednesday of every single month for creative financing. So, um, with these, the launch of this program, or with, excuse me, with Fire Focus, um, we now have an event here every single Wednesday, except for the odd months where there happens to be a fifth Wednesday. So, every single Wednesday, six o'clock, there is now an event in this clubhouse. Um, there's also exchangers every Thursday at 12 p.m., and there's also mixed lunch on Tuesday at 12 o'clock and Chino Cafe over in Chino. So we have three standing events every single week now. Um, and we also, for your members out there, have a Saturday coffee every single month in here. Those dates are posted in the members only Facebook group. If you want to come to those events, you either need to make friends with a member in here or become a member yourself. It's $25 a month and uh, it's about the same price you paid to get in tonight. So uh, if you want to come to more of these or come every single week, it's $25 a month and you walk right in that door, you know, that we spend another dime. And uh, our event sponsor tonight is Deal Machine. If you are, you know what, I'm gonna go into Deal Machine more in my presentation, so I'll just skip that for now. Um, and I'm gonna, this is our stuff that's going through. I'm gonna go through some of this stuff later. So, uh, for those of you that still have, that bought tickets, uh, we're still P4 tomorrow coming out in August, uh, the 26th to 27th. Members, you get a $100 discount. Um, and if you did not receive that, discounted room link to get you new rooms for the August dates, please email the club, thrive at irink.org. Uh, we talked about exchangers, I right, talked about fire focus. I'm doing a podcast for you members out there, you'll get preference. If you want to get on the podcast, just go to that link. That's right there, for those of you on this side of the room, right there. And uh, sign up, it just has access to my schedule. You can register at your convenience. I do it for basically uh, Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays are kind of varying times, so you just take a look at my calendar and throw yourself into a time slot, and we'll go to the studio that's right behind all of us and start recording. And speaking of events, again, Fire Focus is all right there, exchangers, mixed lunch, and then the boot camps and uh, seminars and academies that's all in the works uh, is varying. So that is posted on events.ierec.org. If you want to take a picture of that or go on the website, keep it updated for all these weekly events or anything that's public, that's not members only, it's all posted on Meetup. So if there's a last minute question or anything, it'll be updated on Meetup, okay? Uh, and I already went through that again, 25 bucks a month, you get a shirt, you get access to the Facebook group, you get discounts on all the other events that aren't the weekly ones and you get into those for free. Uh, and I just changed the sponsorship package. And uh, if you're interested in becoming a sponsor, just let me know. Uh, with that, Farah is gonna be running this one. So let's give Farah a round of applause. And while she's coming up here, I'm gonna get her PowerPoint loaded up. Okay. There you go. Hello. <laughs> How's everyone tonight? Woo! Okay, that's a little bit better. There's coffee in the back for those of you who are still sleeping. Um, Andy actually just strolled in right now. Hello, Andy. Or when to put him on blast since he's coming in late. <laughs> All right, let's see. All right, Mike in the left hand. Clicker in the. All right, there we go. Well, um, I'm going to be 
talking a little bit about um, house hacking tonight. Um, I know Marvin and I had a conversation about this probably about a year ago or so. Yeah, more oh, no. So I know he's a fellow house hacker. Anyone else doing some sort of house hacking? Eric, cool. So, yeah, all right, riches too. <laughs> so um, for me, this, I just wanted to go over house hacking because it's something that when you get in real estate and you know you don't have a lot of money, this is a great avenue to take. So um, I, um, Andrew, my life partner over there, thank you. Oh man, this is gonna be weird. I'm so sorry if this is gonna sit. I need to travel with the mic here. Okay, so um, a little bit about house hacking um, and myself. So that's that's me right there. Look at that smiley face over there. Um, all of the name badges I had at Costco, I worked there for 17 years. Um, but it did provide me with an FHA loan for my my first rental. Um, I'll do that in a second. But um, I was there 17 years. I got injured at work. Just it wasn't ideal. It was somewhere I was going to be for the rest of my life. Um, but things happen, right? Um, and then Andrew one day said, "Hey, Sarah, why don't you read this book?" And I was like, "Oh, okay." I'll I'll read it. You know, when your partner tells you to read something, I'll find. So um, I think like after the first 15, 20 minutes, it was an audio book. So the first 15, 20 minutes, I was like, oh, this is something. Like, this is what I want to do. I'm tired of working a nine to five. This is what makes sense. I mean, how many people read Rich Dad Poor Dad felt that way? Yeah, a lot of us. <laughs> So, um, just a little disclaimer, this is just my personal story, um, I am not someone to give legal advice, um, I will give you my personal opinion, but I am no way licensed um, as, I think, oh, where did Andy go? But uh, I only have a driver's license, as Andy says, so um, I like that one. <laughs> well, it expired. <laughs> My forklift license has expired. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> I actually left in 2019 right before COVID, so I heard all the stories from Andrew, but I luckily didn't have to deal with the water and TP craziness. So um, house hacking, I mean, basically, a lot of us know what it is already, but you're, you're finding other ways to, to divide up the house, pretty much, right? So either you're... Um, Actually, that's, I should put that in a different order. Sorry. Um, but yeah, so it's it's the practice of buying a multi-unit, living in one, running out the other, generating more income, right? So some financial benefits. We have lowering your housing costs. So Marvin, uh, how much how much did your housing costs lower after? The, how much did yeah? So your mortgage was whatever amount, and then yeah. renting it. How much did it lower your housing costs? Uh, Twenty seven hundred. Twenty seven hundred a month. That's awesome. Wow. <laughs> All right. Um, we lived rent free, right, Andrew? When, when was the last time you uh, paid a penny towards our housing expenses? Was it a year ago? Two years. Yeah. So it's it's been a blessing for us. Um, potential for rental income. Uh, you're building equity in a property, so I mean, our tenants are paying our rent, and um, we get the equity and <laughs> all that side and everything, right? Um, and then tax benefits, so um, that's huge. So types of house hacking. This is where I was trying to go with that earlier. So roommates. Um, Andrew was not thrilled with the idea when I told him. I see a six bedroom, or sorry, a five bedroom, four bath house. Sorry, I need to interrupt you for two seconds. Two seconds. Um, if you are the owner of a white Dodge Ram that's parked right there, you can move these are your house. And if you are parked in any state, you can move over to White Dodge Ram. <laughs> not parked in any front of any wall doors when you come here. We should have said that at the beginning. That was our fault. All right, so roommates, Andrew was not thrilled at all when he heard about this Oreo 
<laughs> you don't remember that? When I told you about Kendall the first time, I said, hey, there's this house. And then it was under contract, I was so sad. And then I saw it pop back up on the market. I'm like, it's this house again. And when we went to go look at it, it actually had a detached um, garage conversion, which is what we lived in um, during the three years we were there. So that was what we did. Um, but for I think six months while we were renovating, excuse me, while we were renovating it, we did have roommates. So he, we were very happy to get out of there. Because <laughs> so if you have just a personal opinion, um, like I did technically uh, when I had a two bedroom condo in Colorado, I rented the second bedroom. I I was single. I always had roommates. So if you're single and you have roommates, this is a great way, or not single, I mean, just have an extra room and you just want someone quiet, you can find the right tenant. So um, we can go into that in a minute. Um, but I did have a roommate, I think I paid like $300 a month after bills, um, owning a place. And then I sold it, oh, cover Andy's ears. <laughs> I sold my condo. <laughs> And I, um, I actually netted $80,000 when I sold it two years later. So, um, and then I use that for other investments. So it, it does, I mean, instead of throwing away rent um, with a roommate at a apartment, I made $80,000. You can also buy a duplex, triplex, fourplex. You can still get an FHA loan, um, conventional loan, and you live in one unit and you rent out the other ones. So that, I think that's a really common one. Um, we do this with our primary home. There's two houses on our on our lot and we rent out one house for 2,500 and it's a two bedroom and then we live in our other, in, in our house. Um, and ADUs, like I said, the detached garage, so that's another way you could do it. So if you're looking for a property, so when I'm looking at properties, I'm looking for something like with a detached garage or well, can I add on or what's there already and then you can convert it, right? So, or some people look at the floor plan, how can I split this, add a kitchenette, uh, you know, stuff like that. So, and then uh, live in flip. So. I know a couple people that do this where they buy a house, it's a fixer, they live there, they fix it up, and then they sell it. And then that's what they're doing. So they house hack that way. So there's many, many ways to house hack. I did not list all of them. This is a, yes, Andy. What's an important factor if you're gonna live in and flip? Be there at least two years. Why? I, in my head it was there. It didn't come out my mouth? Why? No, okay. Why? <laughs> Why? Both tax benefits. So if you are single, you can take up to, so if you sell it for, and you net $250,000 cash, it's tax free. Um, if you're married, it's $500,000. So I think I mentioned that one time that, that that might push me to get legally married, but. <laughs> California, you can have a thruple or a quadruple here. <laughs> So if you have a thruple, is that 750 then? Okay. All right. Let's add a, a third. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. That's so bad. Okay. Um, and then just, so let me back up just a little bit. I meant to say this in the beginning, but because I'm a little nervous, if you haven't noticed. Um, what's that? Oh, oh thank you. Thank you. Um, but I wanted just to mention that this is a brief overview of, we're not going to dive deep into it. We have every, this is going to be every first Wednesday of the month. So this is an overview. I want to go into more detail, more depth on house hacking, more depth on long-term rentals, short-term rentals, mid-term rentals, but we don't have enough time tonight. So this is an overview to kind of give you a sneak peek of what's to come. I should have started with that, I'm so sorry. All right. Um, so my next project, actually, we have five acres. It's in Cherry Valley. Um, what we want to do with, or I should say what I want to do with and just, he's so sweet. He just goes along with whatever I want normally. <laughs> We're going to live with five other people. Are you okay with that? Yes, say yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he does not like even on the spot. Okay. 
so my, ne my next project, um, I want to split up the lots and then I want to build on those lots. So either mm, maybe sell to keep one or something like that. Um, actually, Marvin again, we talked about this before. So um, each lot I could build a primary home, a secondary home, and an ADU. So ideally I want to rent them. Um, if financially I can't, then I'll, I'll look into doing a refi, um, selling some off, and, and hopefully having a free and clear house. That's like ultimately my goal. So when I build on these other three acres, <laughs> Andy will help me with uh, the financials later. <laughs> but that's, that's what I'm planning to do with this property. Um, so some numbers on our first house hack. So I should say our first house hack, because my first one was in Colorado. I didn't really follow the numbers that well, so I'm going to skip that one. But our first house hack together it was in San Bernardino. We put 3.5% down. It was an FHA loan, and so that was $13,000. Um, closing cost for another $5,000. And then our PITI, $2,200 a month. I should say this is in 2019. <laughs> so we bought the house for 370. Um, and then we currently rent the front house for 2800. And I actually don't rent the whole house out to one family. I rent them in individual rooms. Um, one of my tenants, he's been there three years. Um, he was gonna move out. And then, uh, I don't know, a few months ago, he messaged me and said, hey, can I stay? I said, of course, you always pay your rent early. Stay, please. <laughs> so um, he's still there, but when he moves out, we're actually going to convert that area to like a junior ADU. So we'll do that, and then I'll probably rent that one out for about 1200 a month. Right now he's paying 700 um, And then I have all my tenants pay the utilities. So I add them up, I divide them, I send them off to them. I upload everything into Google Sheets for just transpar transparency, and then they, they could see all the bills and because I mean the, the gas bills right all went up so they could have thought I was just like playing with them but they could see that $300 gas bill so um cap we were cash flowing 600 a month um and then when we moved to our new house that back unit we now rent for 1900 a month so uh, we took some money out of the property Oh, I forgot I did a little spin there. <laughs> um, but we, where did that go? Oh, there we go. It currently cash flows 2000 a month. So, and that, I mean, we weren't paying rent for almost, I think it was a full two years. Um, and then now we're cash flowing 2000 a month. So it's, it's a really nice property. I think it's my favorite one. Um, I tell Andrew all the time, aren't you glad we lived with five other people? He loves it. We'll do it again. All right, so some tips for success. Um, set, so for me personally, especially living with other people, people like, oh, I don't know if I could live with someone else. If you're really, really clear with like your house rules, what you expect, up front, it's in writing, you sit down with them, you get to know them, It'll be a much smoother process when I was in a rush and I was trying to put someone in a room, that's where I ran into problems. Take your time, right? Especially when you're living with somebody in your own house. Establish a rental or a roommate agreement. There's plenty of stuff out there, you can Google it. I've, the one I have, I've changed on how many times issues happen in the house. I've added things. Um, one thing I do is I have a cleaner that cleans all the common areas every other week. So it's, when I had roommates, I remember fighting over whose week it was to clean, who's doing the dishes, all that stuff. So that's what I do, I just avoid that. They're responsible for the room and their bathroom, but other than that, the whole house is cleaned every other week. And then maintain good communication with the tenants or your roommates. So I don't know how many times something has happened in their life where they get back, you know, behind on COVID, right? They got behind on COVID. I immediately talked to them right away. Hey, do you guys have anything going on? 
you know, are you okay? Do you need help? We could set up a payment plan. Everyone was fine. I didn't have any, any problems. Um, the only time I had an issue was someone got in a car accident and the coverage was, her, her accident wasn't covered with her insurance. So she had to come out of pocket. And so we set up a payment plan for that month's rent. She was paying $20 a month and she just got caught up. So she would just pay as much as she could. And if they're late, I tell them, as long as you communicate with me ahead of time, I don't charge a late fee. So I want that relationship with them. Like I want them to tell me if something's wrong with the house. So immediately when they tell me something's wrong, we're there to fix it. So and we're not playing around. Like I don't want them to, you know, just because I moved away, then I'm not going to take care of them anymore. So we, we stay on top of it. Um, some common mistakes. Not screening tenants or roommates carefully. Um, I won't. I won't say names because I am being recorded, and <laughs> you never know who watches these things out in the YouTube world. So there was one guy that he he wanted to move in right away. That was a red flag. Looking back, um, wanted to pay three months in advance. That was a red flag. <laughs> Stuff like that. Um, now that I see it, like if I was just like one with my gut, normally your gut's right. Like just go with your gut. I did it two times, I will not do it a third time. Like I went through an eviction, <laughs> it's not fun. Um, but it's not as scary, right Evan? Evan told me this. If you are faced with an eviction, don't worry, just hire someone. There's fast, fast eviction services is who I used. Um, they handle everything. I mean, you pay the money, but you don't have to worry about anything else. They serve them. They put the notice on the door. It's not as scary as you think. Everyone thinks it takes a really long time to evict people. This girl pulled all the all the strings. She just like throwing everything out there. It took four months, so it wasn't so bad. And then not maintaining the property properly. So that's that's something like. Since we don't live super close, we probably could do a better job of like the exterior, right? Yeah, okay. I mean, we have like a very low maintenance lawn, but um, still, we probably could do that better. And then not addressing tenant or roommate issues promptly. So I get a text message, so-and-so isn't doing this, and I'm like, oh, here we go. So all I do, because I have it in the roommate agreement, I send them a screenshot, hey, this is happening, we need to fix it, and it usually gets fixed on its own. So just having things in writing and clear expectations from the get-go really, really helps. Um, so some lessons learned. Um, I will still buy in California. Like, people are like, houses are so expensive. I'm like, does it have a detached garage? Does it have room to build an ADU? Can I split the house? If I rented each room, what could I get for each room instead? Um, I'm looking into assisted living. Maybe I, I buy a house and I rent it to a assisted living. Um, where is Fernando over there? Maybe Fernando wants to rent my house for a better, like maybe a higher price, but I give him a really long uh, lease and then he could rent his business out of it. Take imperfect action. I made so many mistakes going through all this. So many mistakes, I still make mistakes, but just taking that imperfect action, that's huge. And last, ask for help. This right here, everyone you see in this room, everyone in this club, I was so scared to admit when I was failing and it cost me thousands and thousands of dollars. Thousands. So if you wanna hear about that, you can ask me how many thousands of dollars I lost. <laughs> we have a private conversation. But yes, that's, um, this club is huge. Like uh, Rich had posted, what's your best investment so far? I knew he wanted a property and I, I like messing with him. So I was like, and, and I really do feel like this club, I mean, $25 a month, and I'm not doing a sales pitch, but like $25 a month, like that is insane, right? And you get this community, we have all those events, I mean, I get tired just looking at the grid, so. Um, but yeah, ask for help. And just, this is all about me. My phone number's there, email. So if you want to hit me up, many of you have called me. We've talked for 
you know, 20, 30 minutes up to two, three hours. So um, we can we can talk. So that's that's me right there. I think that's all I have. Um, and then Rich is going to come up and <laughs> he's going to talk about long-term rentals. Um, well, I'll let him say what he's going to talk about. Do you want to take questions? Oh, well, we're, okay, let's do that first. So if there are any immediate questions, I could take those now. We have a couple of minutes. Um, if not, we could do a Q&A session at the end. Yes, Andy. Didn't you call me when the guy was in a hurry to move in and offer three months rent in advance? <laughs> Where were, why, why didn't I call you? The, back to the previous, <laughs> ask for help. <laughs> it's embarrassing. I'm so embarrassed. That's such a dumb question. Why am I going to call? It's one of those. Why? I'm so embarrassed. You know, usually if I'm embarrassed, I'll call Evan because he doesn't make me feel so bad. <laughs> <laughs> so I tell people, Andy's very smart, but it's so obvious to him that you feel. I know how that works. I know Peter. Okay. Yeah. He's too much like me. Let's go with Patty and we'll come over here to James. How do you find your properties? So, I mean, the, the one I house hacks, like, I thought it was just a five bedroom, four bath, regular house. Um, I didn't even, it was on the MLS. And it was, it, I mean, that was in 2019. Um, the current property that I found, I found on the MLS. So you have a realtor, or do you? I, I'm, I'm, on, I'm on the MLS so much, just like looking at, like, what's been on the market a long time, um, what's an investor special, like, the area that I like. But you're not licensed, so you have you access to the MLS? Oh, well, what is it? Yeah, Zillow, Redfin. MLS is, I mean, the MLS is the extra thing is like the notes. I feel like everyone has access now. I mean, you just don't get the agent notes part, but I call several people in the room if you want to. Um, yeah, so the, the current house that I had, uh, or have, that we live at, um, the main house, it was shown as a 2-1, but we turned it into a 4-2. Uh, we bought it for 660. Put a lot into it, and then a lot of interest. And again, ask me how many thousands of dollars I lost. Um, but that one we, it appraised for 985. So we do currently hold almost 350 in equity in that property. Um, so cash poor and equity rich. Anyone else? <laughs> yes, James. I was wondering, do you run into any problems with permits and? Zoning codes when you divide a house and single family residence into three units? So, you're, you said you're recording this right <laughs> So, okay, yes, you need to pull permits. Um, if you're putting a wall in, and that wall can, there's just there's certain things you can do that doesn't require a permit, like putting a microwave wall. I don't. I don't want to comment on that. Vera, this question about the activity, not not really go back not building to, on the house. Anyone want to help me on that? <laughs> he, was, he was asking about the activity of house hacking. If you have to have a permit. Oh, the just to rent rooms right. to have a permit for that or adding so units. Add like a kitchen. I mean, I mean, in the abstract, I don't want you to talk. So. so there's certain things you can and can't have in, like, I notice, like, when you walk into places like a back room, you're not supposed to have a bathroom, you're not supposed to have a full kitchen. Um, some people plummet for that, and then somehow something shows up later. Um, <laughs> I've heard those stories. I just, that's not what I did. Like, my, my house, it was already like that. I just... Re like I just moved the plumbing around in the walls. So. So is that the This is such a bad answer. Pass. <laughs> Sorry, James. Any kind of zoning code that you could look. Talk to your contractor. Do you have a contractor? 
license contractor? No. no. All right. So, um, I would say I know R2, there's some kind of, you know, a whole bundle of restrictions with that, but I, I know the law has yeah. changed recently. Rich will answer on that here in a little bit, because okay. he's more familiar with the splitting of the house. I What I do is I leave the house as it is, and I rent the individual rooms. So that's what I've been doing. Um, and then my property right now, it already had two houses. It's just the way that the walls were in the house and my current house, it was a two bedroom with like three living rooms. So I just made those living rooms into bedrooms. So I didn't pull anything for that. Um, anyone else? Yes, John. The, uh, the ADU that you have, um, is it separately metered? It is not. So what I do for utilities, I divide it by per person. Oh, well, even Yes, so everyone, I mean, it's one electric bill, um, one water bill, everything. So I just do by per person. It averages anywhere from like $70, $80 a month, depending on the, on the months. So, and I tell people that up front. Um, so when I had two people move into one unit, then I was like, hey, it's per person. It helps the other people out because then their bills went down a little bit. Um, but it's two people, so two usages. I will go Gretchen, Bree, and then Vince, and I think we'll call it after that. Okay. I sensed I sensed you were uncomfortable talking about markets. So I've never done that before. I'm happy to pull. What is it about permits that's not comfortable? Well, it's not that I'm I just I don't want to answer that because I'm not an expert. Yes. <laughs> I'm not an expert, so it's it's better to talk to a licensed professional on that one. Bree. Yeah, with your units that you have in that house, um, square footage wise, are they all comparable? So like oh, each room, each room. room. Mm -hmm. So two of the rooms um, have a private bathroom. So it's a master with an ensuite, right? So those ones I charge more, and then the two rooms, the shared bathroom, charge them a little less. So I was wondering more or less about the bills, splitting the bills. Like if they're sharing a bathroom with somebody else, do those two people kind of go in and split that water, or? No, it's just it's people? just the one water bill for the whole property. There's. Have you ever had any pushback on that? No. Or had to overcome? Okay. No. I mean, they're like, oh, it's high this month. I'm like, oh, well, it's all in the Google Drive. You can see the bills. I'm not making up the numbers. I'm not charging them a service fee. I mean, I could. I should. Good one would be like, you should. So, um, and then there was more events. So, do you find that if you rent out all the rooms on a particular property to individuals as opposed to renting to one family, do you make the same or more? I make way more. Way, way, way more. So, when I first did it, I, I do have two tenants that have been there for a long time. So I haven't increased their rent, I'm kind of like waiting for them to leave to increase their rent, but um, I really like them. They pay me, they take care of the house. Like that's more important. It cash flows almost $2,000 a month. I'm not trying to squeeze every penny out of them. Um, so yeah, it was, I, I do it by the room and uh, back, oh, my point was back when I did that, we were making 2,800, or it was 2,600, but I, I would have only rented the house for like 18 or 1,900 at the time. But now rent has kind of caught up. I probably could get about the same, but like I was telling Andrew, I really like our tenants. Um, we we're talking about that on the way here. I really like them. I was like, what if I sold the house? Or what if this? I'm like, I really like them though, and it makes us money. Like, why? Like, why would why would I sell it? Yes, yes. Why would I sell a nice house like that? So, I do every one month to month. I tell them I want if they need to leave, I want them to feel like they could leave. Um, for me, I also want to be able to give them a thirty day notice, <laughs> sixty day if uh, they've been there more than a year. Okay, last question. Yeah, one quick question. Mm -hmm. you tell them these are Yes. Yes. So the, the question um, was if I do, are the bills in my name and I distribute it. Yes, because I don't have like a certain person. I thought about kind of 
nominating someone in the house to take over that role and give them a discount on rent, but it literally, I time myself to do all the bills for that property, my property, um, write the checks that I owe lenders, uh, deposit checks, took me an hour, a month. I think it took me an hour and a half one time because I was <sighs> diddle daddling or something. <laughs> all right, that's all I have. All right, what Farrah didn't mention there too, she's also the event coordinator and the member oh. liaison for the club, so let's give her another round. Okay. So this is her first event that she's had full focus on. Well. <laughs> no, full like, uh, you know, she's like, she was asking me earlier, like, how do you want the tables? I'm like, that is your decision. So, <laughs> so I think she did a really good job with it. It looks great. Um, thank you for all you do, appreciate you. Um, my name is Rich. I don't even remember what slides I put in order here, so I'm gonna have to look at them, sorry. Uh, my name's Rich. I've been doing this for about six years now. I started off as a uh, flipper and wholesaler in 2017 with my dad, Evan, back there, and my mom, Angela, right here. Uh, we still flip and wholesale. We do about 10 a year. Um, before that, I was a recruiter uh, for software engineers. And I also did outside sales in the building products industry. For those of you that do rehabs and you know what Hardy Backer is, I worked for them for eight years. Um, made them a lot of money and they put me through college. So that was fun. Um, I bought my first house in 2020, which I house hacked. I lived in the bottom unit. It was a two unit. I lived in the basement, uh, the 500 square foot basement, and then rented out the really nice top unit with a view and a deck and, you know, uh, three bedrooms and a really nice uh, kitchen and totally redone uh, and it paid for the mortgage and all the utilities so I lived in the basement for free and got to listen to my neighbors pound around a little bit but <laughs> it's okay you know when they're paying all your bills it's it's a little bit easier to like put up with the you know the, the traffic walking across the floor and, and all that so um, by 2022 I bought three more um, I bought a couple more uh, multi-units and then I tried my hand at STRs which we'll go into a little bit also um, and then I bought the club back in June of 2021 currently I have six LTR doors long-term rentals I have one short-term rental that's kind of not operating at the moment because a tree hit it so um, we'll go into that too <laughs> uh, and then I still exchange notes and stuff and all that kind of stuff and uh, probably looking to add like four more doors this year um, I want to get at least two more houses, hopefully they're duplexes. Um, I usually, my goal, um, since we did this intentionally when we all started flipping, um, me and Evan are still W2, so we can still get bank financing. So um, that has worked out really nice um, before the interest rates jacked up, so I don't know how that's going to look this year. Uh, but it was a really great plan until about six months ago. Uh, and then that is me in front of my house about um, two or three weeks ago, I had seven feet of snow uh, on it, and uh, that's pretty much I could walk up onto the roof from that line right there. That's normally about uh, like eight feet. So uh, that's how much snow we got. It was a lot of fun. Found out uh, about two weeks later that I the power went out for six days. I found out about a week and a half later that my whole house generator that everybody told me didn't work. The guy I bought it from told me it didn't work. The people that lived there told me it didn't work. <laughs> Guess what worked the entire time and just needed a jump and a little bit of oil and a good kick. <laughs> and that thing lit up like a Christmas tree. So all the lights, everything worked, but oh well, we had it then. Anyways, uh, so there's a couple stages in the club. Um, that I'll talk about real quick. This presentation is kind of geared more towards dreamers and starters. Um, estate doors, you could probably, hopefully get a nugget or two out of here. Uh, you enders, you wizards out there, there's probably nothing that I'm gonna say tonight that you're not already gonna know, but I'm sure you'll chime in. Andy? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, if you're not familiar with those estate are, we, <laughs> we uh, kind of broke the, uh, Broke people like up into these ideas that you know if you're a dreamer, you're maybe wanting to get into this, but you haven't done it yet. You just heard about it, you think it's cool. Uh, if you're a starter, you've actually taken action. You're, you've made offers. You're out there um, trying to get a deal. Um, 
and uh, but you're, you're still working a, a full-time job somewhere, and your boss is not you. That's the kind of the, the key thing on the starters. Um, the estate builders are people that have now done real estate full-time. They've done more than a few deals, um, and they are actively pursuing financial independence in real estate or fire. Uh, enders are the people that have basically fired. They have become financially independent through real estate, and they are just doing this purely for the love of the game and helping people out. So the idea is, is that we're all lifting each other up. So the people, you know, the enders pull up the estate owners, who pull up the starters behind them and the dreamers behind them, and that everybody's kind of working together here. So, uh, so what kind of housing provider do you want to be? Active or passive? I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, do you want something that's more, uh, more like a job, but you're the boss? Or do you want something that's just like totally passive that you really aren't managing all that much, aside from you gotta pay your mortgages, do the bills, you gotta deal with the tenant issues every once in a while. But for the most part, it's pretty passive. Or do you want like a, you're the type of person that can't sit still, you can't just chill out, play video games all day. Like, you gotta be working, okay? There's no wrong answers here. Um, and then, uh, do you want, you know, maybe less cash flow, but more steady? Uh, without so many bumps in it, or do you want more cash flow, but again, you gotta try it a little bit harder, and maybe you'll, maybe, maybe you'll be in the keyword right there. Maybe you'll get more. We'll see if I got more in this presentation. Uh, and then how creative are you? Uh, are you somebody that just wants to paint it beige and slap a tenant in, or slap a resident in, and call it good, or are you somebody that like, you got dreams of your house being at home and garden someday? Uh, if you're the later, Maybe STR is more your style. Maybe short term rentals are more your style. And then what's your uh, what's your bullshit tolerance? That's a very good question because if you are the type of person that is going to get offended because somebody didn't like the color that you picked in your living room or didn't doesn't like the couch that you picked out or they don't like that they there was something about that hot tub that you just spent like nine grand on and they just don't like. Short-term rental's probably not your game. <laughs> okay, so keep that in mind. Uh, what's the difference? If you're not familiar, uh, Airbnb, vacation rentals, all that stuff, Verbo, that's STR. Uh, long-term is your, the original, the original rental property. Uh, typically longer than six months. Usually you're going for like a year plus on a lease. Just a regular old rent. You can say old guy, I, I know I resemble that. <laughs> I like original gangster. <laughs> old guard, old guy, whatever. It keeps changing. It's something else now, I think. Um, I don't know. I'm not that hip anymore, I guess. So, uh, usually one year plus. Yeah, so like your, your, original, your original rental. Okay? Uh, anybody not familiar with those terms? What is OG? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's what it is. Your original gangster in my, in my book, Joe. Uh, so, some uh, you know pros and cons of each are just differences. Uh, you know, I say LTR is probably the more passive one. That's the one, like I said, you're probably gonna you know paint the walls the landlord special beige and uh, call it a day. Uh, STR, you're gonna be a little bit more active. Uh, you're gonna be dealing, you know, it's, it's a job. Honestly, if you're gonna self-manage a uh, short-term rental, you're basically running a mini hotel. Um, long term rental, you're not doing that. But the trade off is, is that you are going to hopefully, I say hopefully, make a lot more money on your short term rental for your efforts. Whether it's worth it or not is totally up to you. Uh, and you're going to have to go with all these things. So if you guys want to take a picture of the slide, I'm not going to go through every single line here. But, um, you know, for LTRs, they're tougher to find, um, the margins are a lot smaller. Um, it's, just, it's just a harder. Everyone's kind of looking for those passive long-term rentals, right? So uh, you gotta, you know, whether you look at it at cap rates or cash flow per door or however you want to do it, finding a long-term rental that pencils, uh, at least immediately, is is tougher than finding a short-term rental. Who here has looked for a long-term rental? Who here? Uh, keep your hands up. Of those people, who here has looked for a short-term rental? Of you guys, which one's easier? Short-term. Short -term? Easier to find, sorry. Oh, yeah. Who else had their hand up? Short term. Short term, short term, why? Because they always pencil. What was that? They always pencil. 
pretty much. Yeah, like you can make almost any house pencil on a short term rental. The difference is it's more in like, it's more up to you, I guess. It's, 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 you, it's all on your success of running it to hit those numbers. It really doesn't have a whole lot to do with the house at that point. It comes down to you. Uh, whereas long term, you know, you got your rental market, you know, that, that applies to short term a little bit, but there's just so much more of a spread in short term rental that makes it easier to find. Um, and then with LTR, I mean, one, one thing that's nice about STR too is, is you get daily, maybe weekly payouts. Um, you know, if you're, if you're turning guests quickly, you're getting cash flow all month long. There's no like stress on if you're gonna get that check at the end of the month. Uh, Airbnb or Verbo, whatever, they're gonna pay you as soon as that guy, before the guy even walks out the door. Hey, so, yes sir. This young lady threw the jargon flag at you. <laughs> She's too, uh, too bashful to raise her hand and say something. Wait, got it. I had a question about what it meant, what you meant by pencil. So pencil is just uh, like a general term that we say, like if it, pen, if it deal pencils, it makes sense. So if we're like writing out the, the math, um, and whatever our, our buy box is, like what we want to make, uh, whether that's some people do it with a cap rate, some people do it with like a percentage, an ROI, cash on cash, there's all different parameters, and it depends on you. Um, but the term penciling is basically like, if it pencils, it's good. If it doesn't pencil, it doesn't work for whatever goal you're trying to get to. Uh, the other thing about LTRs versus STRs is uh, STRs are sexy. They're like, it's cool to have an STR. You got an operating Airbnb that's crushing it. You have a, probably a really nice house that's doing really well. It looks great on Instagram. You look great in the house on Instagram. <laughs> So it's 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 awesome. You know, you're not you're probably not gonna go like take selfies in your long term rental with like the, the, the old ass like thirty year old stove that's like check me out, right? Like it's it's probably not gonna be that cool. But you know But I've heard people say Andy I feel like it was you, but I feel like I've heard it uh, from other people too. Um, I don't you know a lot of people don't want their investments to be exciting. Okay, like you want, you really, a lot of people really want their, their investments to be boring. Um, the more exciting it is, I think it might have been Warren Buffett or something with, with stocks. It was like, the more exciting it is, it's not fun in investing. Like, you don't want the thrill of like losing money every month <laughs> if you're going to be investing in stuff. But maybe you do. Like I said, maybe you're just, you need that in your life. You know, I don't know. But, anyways, uh, let's move on here. Uh, so finding LTRs, uh, there's there's a lot of ways. Um, you can go to Deal Machine. Deal Machine is a driving for dollars app. If you sign up with the club, you get like 15 free mailers, and you can drive around and look for tired landlords. There's all kinds of like uh, filters you can put into Deal Machine. People that have owned it for a long time, high equity, um, you know, whatever whatever it is, whatever you're targeting, uh, and you can drive around and just look for rentals that look like somebody just doesn't care anymore. You know, they were boring. It was a boring rental 10 years ago, and it just only got more boring. So, but it could be exciting for you. Uh, and uh, PropStream does also something you can use. There's another link there. Uh, and you can build lists. So, I mean, this is basically like, you know, how to find just deals in general. But they apply to, to long term rentals because if you can make something, you know, if you can talk directly to the seller and get something direct from them versus the MLS or versus, you know, other means. Um, you, it's gonna be, it's gonna pencil. It's gonna pencil a lot better if you can get it direct from the seller. Um, and then obviously you can go to Zillow, Redfin, the MLS. There's lots of rentals that people are either getting rid of for one reason or another. Um, and generally, if you're new to this uh, and you're looking for long terms, you can stick to the 1% rule, uh, which is basically, if the gross rents can come in to be uh, one percent of the purchase price, it'll probably pencil out for a long-term rental. I think I said that right. Yes, it's okay. not a good rule, but you said it right. <laughs> I didn't say it was a good rule. <laughs> Are you interested in another slide, or is this your list? Because there's a real good one you skipped. I guess that's my only one. What do you got? I wasn't done yet, but what do you got? Eviction court. What? Eviction court. Oh. I thought you said the bitchin' cord. I was like, what's that? <laughs> that sounds bitchin'. <laughs> what's that? That 
Eviction court. Eviction court. Yeah. Eviction court. So, uh, I probably, you know, it might be a little, a little more advanced, but okay. that could be one way. Could be one way. We have to talk about that. I've never done that. So, I don't know. I don't know. Well, I'm sure you'll grill me on it later. Though. <laughs> <laughs> or, uh, like I said, so you can stick to one percent rule. It's just a general. It's like you know, it's just a general thing that um, it helps people that are maybe newer to this stick to. That you can instantly just look at any property and be like, okay, if, it, if it's three hundred thousand dollars and you get three thousand dollars a month of rent, you might have something there. Okay, you got to go deeper than that, but it might have something. And if you are looking for an agent. I didn't tell her I was going to put this on here. But if you're looking for the best agent, contact my mother. Right there. No, she's been my agent on two, two of the rentals now. Yeah. And she looked over the paperwork, anyways. But uh, she's fantastic. She's a really, uh, really big attention to detail, which is something that's really good with agents. Um, and she's phenomenal at it. So give her a call. Uh, and then obviously. Come to this club, uh, exchangers especially, there's always stuff there. Um, you know, either people looking to get rid of property or stuff or trade stays at their Airbnbs or, you know, it's just about a, you gotta network, you know, to find better deals. So, so you have six houses last week? I think so. I think there was like 11 deals overall. And six houses, something like that. Uh, and then tips for finding good tenants. You know, I don't think there's really anything, probably all that astounding here, but, uh, I stick to a 630 credit minimum score, minimum credit score. Uh, the one time I went down from that, I regretted it. So I just stick to that now. The three times the rent for income. I did two and a half times if utilities are included. So, and a lot of my houses are utilities included. So a lot of my tenants are, you know, I, I kick down a little bit because the rent's included in utilities. So they don't need to make three times plus utilities. You know, if that makes sense. Uh, and then spend the money on nicer fixtures. I think they'll last a lot longer. Um, you know, the Home Depot $100 toilet is great for your flips. Um, I wouldn't go put a $600 toilet into your flips, but uh, for your rentals, you might want the one that's a little bit nicer. Um, also, a good idea is if you can, if you've had them long enough to replace toilets or faucets or fridges or whatever, buy the same thing over and over again. Because when you need parts, from one house, or the you know the fridge that broke, and you need parts for the other one, or, or the stove, or the you know the toilet, or whatever. Like, because you know you'll need like one part of a of a kit that costs a hundred dollars, and you need like one little the bladder out of the toilet or something like that, and and then you don't have, and you don't need it, but then you need that other part that was part of it for the next one. So it's uh it's nice to just have a little bit of an inventory of extra stuff, um, and if you really want to get fancy. I Google nice pictures and I got this really cool like duck thing that I was like kind of want that. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, I want it. I want it. I thought it was a dragon at first, but a duck works too. Oh, yeah, swan. Whatever, some kind of foul. <laughs> uh, and then just some other tips too. Know your lease. Um, you know, I had a, I recently, during the snowstorm, I had a garage collapse and uh, the tenant was, had their car in it. And, you know, they were, they kind of caught me off guard with how upset they were about it. Uh, I knew they were upset and I was trying my hardest, but they, they were so oblivious to like what was actually going on around the town uh, because their car was stuck in the garage and they couldn't go anywhere and, there, and the grocery store imploded also. So there was like nowhere to go in town. And so they just weren't really aware of like how hard it was to like get a crew up there to cut the roof off of their car and get the car out and shovel the snow out of the way. And so, you know, they confronted me on it and they're like, you're just not doing anything to, to, to make this happen. And you just seem to be like kind of, you know, dragging your feet. It didn't help that when I called the county, it was like a three hour long wait and they never called me back. And then when they called the county at like six in the morning, they got right through to somebody, like right to the head inspector that just happened to walk in early that day. And then, okay. And, um, but anyways, like I have it in my lease that I actually had like 30 days to correct the problem. And I actually didn't know that. Like I forgot that I had written that in my lease. And so when they said like, you're, you know, you're, it's been like, you know, almost two weeks and you haven't done anything, you know, it would have been really nice to be like, look, like I know it's hard, but like, this is why in my lease, like I have the amount of time to, to, to deal with this. 
but I didn't know that. So like I, I kind of got off guard, caught off guard. Um, and it, I don't know if it would help to throw the lease at them, probably not. Um, but it would have made me feel a little bit more confident in having that conversation because I was like, oh shit, like, like you're right. Like, I, I'm, I'm not trying to like take my time on this, but like I can see. So anyways, long story, um, know your lease. Uh, and then pet policy, I have a really like reasonable, fair pet policy. Um, I do allow pit bulls, uh, and I had two for 14 years, so, um, but I understand the risks of having one. Um, yes, I take my insurance that they're covered. And uh, uh, there's no pretty restrictions with my insurance coverage, let's put it that way. Um, but anyways, like, so I allow dogs, I allow cats. Um, I have uh, certain parameters, and I charge for it. I charge a, a monthly pet fee. Um, and I charge a pretty hefty security deposit. Um, but I allow it, you know, because I think you get better tenants. I, I guess I trust dog people a little more. <laughs> and cat people. And cat people. Cat people. Yeah. Uh, do, you, do you trust cat people? <laughs> As a recently cat person. Just let you know that he has a cat. Yeah, and she's chewed my blinds already. The blinds I put in for the tenants. <laughs> so, you know, but she's still done less damage than the, I'll get into that. So I, I don't allow anything under, I don't allow any any dogs under a year old, or any cat, I don't allow any, any animals under a year old. So no kittens, no puppies. Um, again, I let that go one time, and that puppy did, uh, almost a thousand dollars worth of damage. They chewed every single uh, door, uh, door jam. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so I won't do that. This next person that applied, they had a, you know, six month old, uh, was it Great Dane? <laughs> I was like, nope. <laughs> nope, sorry. And then they tried to pull the, uh, the emotional support animal card. Yeah. And, six uh, month old Great Dane emotional support. Yeah, in training. In training. In training. I was going to let them, I almost, I almost let them. And then she turned into. <laughs> I would not want her as a tenant, let's put it that way. Anyways, uh, friendly but firm. Also, I am very, you know, I am friendly with my tenants. I'm not friends with my tenants. Uh, most of my tenants are, are residents. Most of the residents are around my age, maybe a little bit younger. Um, and I'd probably get along with them, to be honest with you. But I just think it's a conflict of interest. I'll be friends with you after you move out. And you didn't trash my house, so you pay rent. Then we can be friends. But until then, I'm not friends with, my, with any of my residents. Uh, but that doesn't mean I'm not nice to them and take care of them and do anything I can for them. So I just don't go out for drinks and bowling with them. Unless they happen to be at the bowling alley when I'm at the bowling alley. <laughs> uh, systems. OK, so I pre-screen all my applicants uh, ahead of time. So unless they just apply to Zillow, which I have open to, but for the most part, like people message me, I ask them three questions: What's your estimated credit score? Your number of occupants? And do you have any pets? Um, if it's not within the parameters that I clearly set uh, in my listing, I pretty much don't even apply. I assume that they didn't read the listing, and I assume they can't read a rental agreement either. Sorry. Um, I use rentspray.com for all my screening and background and credit checks. They also do rough checks. Um, for, it's like $9.99 a month, and you can turn it off. So like, if you have a vacancy, you can pay for like two months and then run all your stuff and then turn it off if you want. Um, but they do a really good job. Uh, the screening package that they do is really thorough. Uh, the background checks are really thorough. It's way better than Zillow. Zillow is like built-in application. It works, but it sucks. Uh, and the rec check thing is cool. Like you can basically like have it. They'll they'll verify stuff for you. Um, like what? The so in the application, they'll put like their previous employer or their previous landlord or whatever, and then you basically click a button and they'll call or send an email and have it verified. Um, now, keep in mind, like I don't know how. I mean, they could just say yep. You know, and just be, <laughs> I don't know what they're actually doing to do that. Um, generally, it's more like a feel good type thing. Like, if, if they're already at the parameters and they're making enough money and I've talked to them and like they got that far, it's more like just a, a step. Um, because, and I, I'll tell you why in a second. Um, 
why is the ref checks cool, but it's not like a, a really big deal to me. And I'll tell you why in a second. Um, Erentpayment.com, I get automatic uh, payments from all my from all the residents. So when they sign when they sign the lease, they basically sign a um, a form that has their routing and banking info on it, and it just automatically debits from their account every single month, and it automatically charges them a late fee. So if it bounces, they have to go back and into the system and use that system to pay when they go to pay, and it automatically puts the late fees in. So there's no like. I have to then collect rent and collect the late fees. Like it's all baked in, um, and it generally is—it's pretty cool. Like it's—it's it's, uh, if, if it bounces, they don't do anything from there. Like they don't keep going after the person. Um, but I like the the rent fee part or the, the late fee part because I charge fifty dollars a day up to two hundred fifty dollars maximum for the month. So uh, and I give no grace period. So if it doesn't pay, if it's not paid on the first, you're late. Um, and that's how it was when I went in places for 10 years, and guess what? I was never late. So I took that from them. Um, so this new thing, this used to be called uh, the Closing Docs. It's called PayScore.com now. Um, and it's a, it's a third-party income verification. And this is why I don't really worry about the ref checks too much, okay? So um, occasionally I get pushback on this, but it's very rare. Um, and I just don't rent them if we get that far, if they really don't want to do it. So what they do is they go log in with the same bank information, so your Chase app. They go log in on this payscore.com website, and it shoots me a report. It says that, yes, you are making exactly what you said you were making in your, in your um, application. And it will show me, all it shows is deposits. So that it's, it's kind of like a, it's a win-win for me. I don't have to go through any bank accounts or bank statements or anything like that. And then I can tell them, I don't have to go through your bank statements. Do you want me to go through your bank statements? Like, I don't want to know what you spend your money on. I just want to know that you're getting paid the income that you say you're getting paid. And it just shoots a report. It says, yes, they make three times what the, put the rent in. And then it just tells you yes or no, they make, they make it. And it verifies. And if for some reason it fails, I don't rent it. It's, it's literally like a protection against any type of fraud, any type of Photoshopping a, a pay stub, anything. Like it's you can't you can't defeat this. <laughs> What's up? Do you have to pay every time? Yes, it's uh it's ten dollars a person, and I pay. That. I tell them that too. So like it's something I pay, it's protection for me. I'm the one that's like insisting on it. So um, I don't mind paying ten dollars. If it pay ten, if I gotta pay ten dollars to like get that kind of verification that like, mortgage companies use, and basically like there's no way to get around it, I'll pay that ten dollars all day. Also, the rent free, you have you know, you have rent free is uh, they pay that, so they it's a normal application fee. I think it's like thirty five dollars. They, um, they pay that. Yeah, that's their application fee. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't collect the, I don't do it myself. So they go, they apply through that. Um, and uh, but the, the thing I was talking about, the pro version that you can do like ref checks with and stuff, that's ten dollars a month if you want the. And you can also with rent free, you can do all your rent docs and everything in e sign. Like in built into the program, it's like I got a built-in DocuSign that you can. So it's really cool. It keeps track of all your documents, keeps track of all your. And I think there's actually a baked-in thing now that they have that's kind of like e-rent payment, where you can accept ACH rent payments. And also, I haven't done that yet though. What is an ACH? Uh, it's like an automatic clearinghouse, automated clearinghouse. So it's like a, it's like a, it's like a wire almost, but not a wire. So it's like a, it's like a debit. So what's up? Right. Yes, there is a delay. That's the one. Glad you brought that up. There's the. That's the one trade-off for making it easy. Is I usually don't get the rent payments, so they don't send you the rent payments until it clears. So it takes a few days to clear. So by the time I get it, it's usually like the sixth or the seventh of the month. But how does that work with late payments? That's so I won't know until like three or four days after the month after the end of the month that it didn't clear. So then when they go back and have to go pay, you know, so it gets kicked back. And by that time they probably already told me that they're gonna be late. But they don't get to just Venmo me the rent. They still gotta go back to erentpayment.com on a form that's linked to the, put the address in and then it automatically puts the late fee in there for them. And there's also a fee. There's also a fee for it. Um, it's three dollars per transaction. You have the option to either pay that, they pay it, or they split it with you. I have it set up that the residents pay the three dollars. Okay. Um, 
And PetScreening.com, kind of same thing. Uh, I, I do a separate pet application for all pets. Um, it's got a pet, if, if, uh, if you're not familiar with it, it gives them a pet score, basically. So it's like a five paw score. And you set the parameters yourself. Um, and that's how the rent payment is, very, or excuse me, the, the pet fee is set by the number of paws that they get. So it's up to like, so it's like $20, it's minimum of $20, like a, a maximum of $60. And it's essentially somewhere between like your, your 13 month old Great Dane is gonna be $60 and your, your five pound eight year old Chihuahua is gonna be $20. Okay, so it varies in between there based on a lot of factors. If they have coverage for them, if, you know, if they're spayed, if they're whatever, if they have insurance, if there's a bite history, like anything like that. If they get a zero, they get they get kicked out. Is that a per month or per year charge? Which? For the difference. Oh, that's per month. Per month. I'm trying something new. Um, so I, I, in the past, I took like a two hundred dollars security deposit, and then I did the pet rent. Also, I'm trying something new. Uh, I was going to either do like a five or six hundred dollar month um, the security deposit, or not a month. Sorry, a one time five hundred five hundred deposit, or the monthly pet rent. I give them an option. So that's what Batani does. They give them the option. I was like, yeah, maybe I'll try that. I don't know if I'm going to do it. But I'm rolling around. What's up, Joe? Yeah, on your uh, rent spree, do you uh, take that kind of application from everybody who meets your rent screening right here? So you've got 20 applicants, for example, that meet the pre screening. Do you uh, do they all do a rent screen? Generally, yeah. So I either a lot of people just apply through Zillow because I have it. I have it on just so people can do it. Um, if if I get as far like that, I think they're going to be a good tenant, like a good resident, and like I want to move forward with them, and they've already paid through Zillow, I, I will tell them. I will say, hey, I'm going to send you a link that's different than Zillow. Please use this. If they've already applied, um, and I really, really like them, I have them. I usually have them pay the, or do the rent free one also, and I pay. I'll pay the thirty five dollars. What's that? Where do I advertise? Uh, mostly Zillow and Facebook. That's pretty much it. And, and Zillow like sends out to Hot Pads and Trulia and some other places too. So, um, okay. Tips for STRs. So we're gonna move into the short-term rental space. So I have one. What's up, James? Uh, if you have you ever bought a place that had a rental that was already in the house? No, not as a rental. I haven't. I haven't inherited any residents now. So, but I'm gonna move into short-term rentals because I know oh. we're probably going over a little bit here. Um, Couple tips, real, real quick here. So, choose what you want to be up front. Um, if you're going to high end, I would stick with it. I wouldn't try and like go high end and then cheap out on the linens or cheap out on like the you know the soap or or whatever. Like if you're gonna if you're really gonna go for that level, make sure you stick at it and you gotta have it budgeted in for like the you know however long you're gonna do this for. You know if you're saying I'm gonna run my STR for a minimum of six months or a minimum of a year and see what happens. Do it the whole time. Like, don't freak out in month three and then immediately like pull the rug out from all of your all of your guests and start putting in like one ply toilet paper and wondering why you know people are like this is five stars. You know, so uh, find a reliable cleaner. I think that's probably the biggest the biggest one. Uh, and attention to detail is something that's completely different uh, from having your own house cleaned versus having an STR clean. So, like, if you have a really good cleaner that cleans your house right now. Um, ask yourself, has she ever left, have you ever found your own hair in your shower? Okay. You, like your own hair, like a piece of your own hair, right? Like you find, this is the difference between like a hospitality clean and like a clean, you know, just having to be a cleaning person. Is if when your hair is in your shower, you don't really care that much, you know, it's not a big deal. When you go to a hotel and there's a big old black giant long hair in the shower that's not yours, how does that make you feel? Right? You don't like it. So that's a, there's a big difference between a hospitality clean and a, and, a, and your own clean. So you know things like going under cleaning under the uh, the couches and the, the fixtures and all that stuff becomes very important, especially in a higher end home. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna come back to some questions. I'm gonna keep moving through. Um, your linens are gonna get trashed. 
regularly. Just get over it. Just like, if you can't stomach it, then find find cheaper linens that still have like a, a good quality feel for it, if that's what you're going for. Uh, you need to have lots of sets, and they're gonna get trashed. I bought six sets at the beginning of mine. In six months, I bought them. They were all gone. They were all they were all trashed. So, and I bought actually nicer ones. So we'll see if that was worth it. Uh, again, you gotta have thick skin. It's hospitality. It's not a popularity contest. I know it feels like it sometimes you're trying to get those like five stars and you know those good reviews and stuff like that, but to get that you need to be hospitable. It's not like you're trying to get them to like you, you want them to like the property and their experience. It's a big difference. Um, if it looks great on Instagram, again, like it's that's great. But if they get there and you've cheaped out on the supplies and the linens and you're sleeping on sandpaper and using sandpaper toilet paper. It's not gonna be, that's not hospitality, okay? Instagram likes do not get you, to, do not translate to five-star reviews, okay? Uh, get your systems in place ahead of time. It's really, really important that you like have this stuff nailed down um, before you go live because it's gonna get harder. And it's gonna get harder to put those systems into place as the guests are there. Um, so the most you can, the more you can put into place ahead of time, the better. Um, and then pick management companies carefully. Um, this is huge. Uh, if, if you have a management company that is sounds too good to be true, with most things, they probably are. If you have a management company that's being a little more realistic, maybe not telling you what you want to hear, um, but being a little bit more realistic, you know, hey, we, we think it can maybe make this, but, you know, I don't know. Like, I don't really think it can. Like, it, it might, but, eh, you know, experience would tell me otherwise. They're probably the ones you should go with or pick a different house. Um, so systems for SDRs, guesting for hosts is what we use. Uh, it's just a guest communication portal. It lets you talk to all your guests outside of Airbnb. Uh, it basically like filters all your stuff from Airbnb into this program that's better than Airbnb's backend system, okay? Uh, you also have like reservation management, it puts it into, uh, it just does a lot better. It's like what Airbnb's backend system you would think would be <laughs> for a global company running many hotels. But um, there you go. Price Labs is in, uh, it's like a pricing data. You can automate your pricing. Uh, and what that does is like, so you can basically set a minimum and a maximum of what you want to do. And you can you can have it set it automatically. It's, it's like almost like AI, like uh, housing or like rental data. So it takes all of the, all of the short term rentals that it scrapes from like Airbnb and Verbo and all those sites and it gets all the data together and then we'll adjust your pricing accordingly. So like if let's say, you know, you don't know that a month from now it's Memorial Day and you forget that you forget to like raise your prices by $100 a night or whatever, this thing will do it for you. Same thing with like other holidays or just things you weren't, you know, maybe you don't, you don't know what, you know, some holiday in there that you're just not aware of or some festival, like this thing will detect if all of a sudden, uh, the prices are skyrocketing in Palm Springs for some weekend or whatever, and you just didn't know that you know, I don't know, Clay Aiken was in town or something, you know. So, uh, so it's it's really cool. It, it varies, and some it'll, it'll also like adjust the price. I guess there's something with Airbnb that it likes when it, the pricing is adjusted a lot. For whatever reason, it's like the way the algorithm works. Um, so this thing will like adjust. It'll, it'll change the price like a dollar a day, just so you're constantly like just changing and moving. So somehow it helps. Um, and then again, like you can, there's all kinds of stuff. I mean, there's literally like people that are specializing in just this price lapse thing now. Um, because you can, you can set it so that like, you know, six months from now, they have to do a four month minimum or four day minimum stay. And then as it gets closer, then you can unlock three days and two days and one days and last minute, you can give discounts, you can increase prices, you know, 20%, you know, to try, because let's say you don't want to do a same day turn because same day turns, which is basically you have a guest leaving in the morning and you have another guest coming that night and you got to turn over the entire place. It sucks. Trust me. <laughs> It's a lot of work because you got to clean all the beds, do everything. You got to literally turn the entire house in about five hours. So it's rough. Uh, but if you're willing to do it, but you're only willing to do it if they pay you 
40% more than your normal wet nightly price because that's your that's your tolerance for BS. <laughs> that's your fee. Uh, you can do it. So there's a lot. It's really cool. Check it out if you if you have an STR. Uh, because I think and again Airbnb has something that's built into Airbnb. It's garbage compared to this thing. So um, simply safe or basically security cameras. Um, Fair posted a, a question about simply safe. Um, give me an idea. Uh, I have both. So I have simply safe on my STRs and then all the flips are with uh, Ring. Um, simply safe is a really, really cool system. Um, if you have one house, if you have one house. So I have one house with simply safe on it. And it's really cool. It's got it's got multiple sensors, which I think Ring has a lot of now. At the time, about a year ago, I don't think Ring had all these. But it's got like a free sensor that goes in your basement. It's got a sensor you put behind your toilet that detects leaks. And it did one time, and it went off and really pissed the guests off. But it it uh, it kept they they put a the guest filled the sink with like dumped their cooler of ice into the sink, and the sink's a giant stainless steel like deep sink. And the condensation that it caused made it start dripping on the drain a little bit underneath the thing. And that thing detected it at two in the morning and started going off. And they were they were pissed. I was like, oh, it worked. I mean, that's what it's there for. And like, oh, I was happy. I was like, oh, it was actually a leak. <laughs> you know, sorry. Oh, but I, I went over there and had three dogs that they weren't supposed to have. So, you know, that's probably what they were actually pissed off about. Um, but uh, it also has like an automated door lock, um, all the cameras linked together. Uh, it's it's a really cool system, but I think Ring's UI and their like app that you can have is, is way more user friendly. Um, Simply Safe is very clunky. Um, and with Ring also, uh, you can give people access to individual stuff. So like if you have a Ring camera, you can invite people to that individual Ring camera, even down to the camera, not just the, the, the house. I'll get to you in a second. Um, you, can, you can share that. If you want to give them access to your Simply Safe, you have to share the entire account to them, and then when they log in, it kicks you out. So, and you can't go back in until they log in. If you log in, it kicks them out. So, it's really frustrating for like, if you have a team, that is supposed to be managing this stuff. It's super, super frustrating. What's up, Andy? Uh, my, my, one of my clients in the short term rental had me take down a bunch of cameras because Airbnb apparently has a problem with cameras on like swimming pools. Only in private areas. So there's, you're still allowed to have in public, public areas. So common areas, you're still allowed. You can't have it in any bedrooms. You can't have it in any bathrooms. Um, but you can have it on entries. You can have it on. You can have it on a pool deck. Um, you can have it in a in the house in a common uh, hallway. You, when I say you can, I wouldn't. I would never put a camera in a house. But how about, sound, how about sound sensor? I do have noise sensors on the decks outside, um, and they don't record audio. They just literally like they. It's like a decibel monitor, and it. it doesn't record audio. Um, and those I don't even just, I think I think I have somewhere in there that there's like some noise sensors on the thing, but they're not recording audio. I've never had a single person ever ask anything about it. But I haven't shown up the door at 10 p.m. telling them to make it do that. Yeah, I haven't really had a problem with sound, shockingly. That's the, uh, you know, probably the only problem I've ever had. <laughs> uh, and then uh, ChatGPT. You guys aren't familiar with ChatGPT, it's like the AI. Copywriter that's been stealing everybody's job. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, it's really fun. It's really fun. So, for those of you that saw Exchangers, you know, I had a nice little story about you and our wizard Andy Teasley. That was ChatGPT. It wasn't me. I know. I know. I know. You're super disappointed. You're like, holy shit, Rich is a great, fantastic writer. I'm not. But this thing is. This thing's really cool. This thing's really cool. So you can put this, so I took my Airbnb listing and I put it into that thing and I said, hey, rewrite this and optimize it for Airbnb. And it literally did like everything in my, everything in my head that I wanted it to, to type, but it did it instead of me like just fumbling around for hours trying to make it, make it happen. So it does it, yeah, it does it in like 30 seconds. It's really cool. Uh, I would caution you need to check like what it writes. Don't just copy and paste it. And put it in there. It, 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 it has a tendency to over elaborate. Um, so, but it makes writing descriptions really, really cool, really nice. 
But you know what, I'm gonna keep going here because I know I'm, I'm, I'm already way over. So uh, maybe on the, the Q&A panel we do at the end, I'll take more questions, okay? Uh, finding SDRs, throw a rock like we talked about, pretty much any house can be turned into an SDR uh, within reason. I would go for failed listings on the MLS. Right now, I, I see them in my town in Crestline. Um, I see them all over the place of people that, when I say failed listings, I don't mean listings that expire and they're just regular houses for sale. I mean failed Airbnbs that people put a lot of money into and then just decided it wasn't for them. Okay, there's a lot of those on the MLS right now. Uh, I'd look for underperforming uh, properties. You can do that on like something like AirDNA. Um, you can basically like find people. So something that's interesting about Airbnb that you, if you didn't know, is anything below, they do this on purpose. So like you normally think that like four stars out of five isn't bad, right? Yeah. Right? Right. Like four, four, you know, three out of five is okay. Four is good. Five is excellent, right? Airbnb basically took that system and like, a 4.7 is terrible, okay? A 4.8 is okay. A 4.9 is good. A 4.97 is excellent. If you're not in a high 4.9, you're not doing well. Like that's that's how the, the system on Airbnb works because because what happens? If, if you're a guest and you're looking for a house and you see three stars, you're not going for that one. You're gonna go for the one that's four. But if you see one that's 4.92 versus the one that's 4.97, you're gonna look at them equally, right? So, so look for underperforming ones. You can go to AirDNA and you can go find those properties that are at like a 4.6, a 4.6, and I think they shut you down on a 4.6. So anything above that, if, if uh, so like between a 4.65 and like a 4.8 is struggling. Okay, so if you go find those on AirDNA, you can contact those, those property owners, because those, they're probably hurting a little bit. There's something going on there that's just, you know, whatever it is. Um, and you can convert your existing LTRs, or maybe you can convert one unit. If for those of you with multi-units, you want to give it a shot, that's probably the safest way to do it, honestly. If you have an extra unit that's maybe coming up for rent, you want to try your handed STRs, turn it, or excuse me, yeah, turn, turn your extra unit into an STR. Uh, and then network, there's a lot of people in this club with STRs, and there's a lot of us that are maybe tired of doing it. <laughs> Come talk. Uh, but anyways, uh, numbers wise, so that was my duplex. I, my first house that I bought, I put in, so when this number is positive, it cost me $20,000 to get that house with my down payment. A year later, I was really lucky, I bought it in March 2020. Does anybody remember what happened in March 2020? Yeah, I was terrified, I was terrified. Literally, they just shut down Disneyland. <laughs> My mom's laughing because she's, she's telling me, well, back up a second. So she was telling me, like, there's this thing going on, and, like, you know, they're, like, closing down Italy. I was like, yeah, yeah, let me know when they shut down Disneyland. Then I'll care. And about two days later, she's like, they're shutting down Disneyland. And I was like, shit. So, uh, and I was in the middle of escrow to buy this house. And it was my first house. She was my agent. And, uh, and I didn't know what to do. This club is the, I didn't own it back then, but this club is the reason why I bought that house. And because Steven, the old owner, and Andy, we were on a Zoom call, and they were like, what's the interest rate? And I didn't want to say it, I was embarrassed. Because I was like. <laughs> and, he's, and Andy was like, is there a two in front of it? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, buy the fucking house. That's, that's basically what Steven said, that was exactly what I was quoting. Buy the fucking house. And I was like, all right, well, we'll see what happens. So what happened was, a year later, I refinanced it. I pulled, I got 50,000, I bought it on an FHA, which had uh, mortgage insurance on it. A year later, I refinanced it, pulled $50,000 out of it, and my payment went up $50 because of the way the PMI switched. I knocked out PMI. So I got the house, basically I had that house for, for nothing. I, I, even with having to replace a sewer line, six months ago, and losing the garage about three weeks ago. I still, unless I put another $28,369 in that house, I have nothing into that house. That garage is probably gonna cost me 30 grand, but wow. you know, we'll see. Uh, so I, I cashed about 14, 1500 a month on that on that house uh, between the two units. So I would say that's probably a decent deal. That's the one I'm probably gonna put in the Facebook group. Um, and then, uh, so with that, when I refinanced that, I took that and bought the triplex. Uh, which cost me the next house, which uh, had about $24,000 in like 
down payment again, I bought that one off 5% conventional. Um, and then, and then, and I lived in that one too. So when I lived in that one, I lived in one unit and then renting the other two units, I cash flowed like $1,000 a month while living there for free. So if you can live in a non-informing triplex that you can get for a 5% uh, conventional loan, I'd highly recommend it. That house now cash flows $2,400 a month. Um, and then I decided that I wanted to be sexy. <laughs> I wanted to be sexy and buy a, buy a short-term rental. I wanted to be, I wanted to be that hot guy on Instagram in the really cool house. <laughs> And uh, it, didn't, it didn't go that well, but you know, we have options. The, 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 I'll get into that in a second. So I have $103,000. Sorry, these are backwards. These should be backwards. I bought the STR next, then I bought the LTR, the, the third one. So I have $103,000 wrapped up into my uh, short-term rental, the stag in Crestline, if you want to check it out, if you want to go see my, my really cool Instagram. Um, and I cash flow, Anyone want to read that number for me? Because I heard so many say. <laughs> yes, I, I, at the six and a half months that I've had that short-term rental, uh, it makes it negative sixty-seven dollars a month for the hundred and three thousand dollars that I have into it. Is that because of snow and everything or something? No, this is lush. You know what? The snow probably helped. <laughs> The snow made me go, screw it. I'm not gonna worry about it for about a month because this was the snow came right after a tree dropped on it. Right. Oh. From the no, no, not from the wind. There was no wind. Uh, I wouldn't know. I wasn't there. I wasn't there. I came home. There was a. There was a. This, I came back. My cleaning lady showed up and she said, said "There's a tree on the roof, and, and and there's stuff coming through the ceiling." And I said, "Great. I'm going on a cruise. I'm going to the Bahamas for two weeks." I'll deal with it when I come back. And I told the, the person that I had coming in for a midterm rental that was going to pay me $3,800 a month. I was finally going to cash flow. Uh, Fine. <laughs> finally going to make $800 a month without even trying. Uh, and uh, and then a tree dropped on. So my short-term uh, rental ride has been uh, a little bit ups and downs, but um, I don't really know what I'm going to do with it yet. Because uh, literally, I had a, I had a management company running it for six months. Um, they did things very well, they did things very poorly, I'll leave it with that. Um, they got 27, 28 five-star reviews in a row. So you think that'd be, that'd be that's good, right? Yeah. That's, that's pretty good. Um, but, you know, their back-end management wasn't so stellar and, uh, you know, couldn't turn it into profit. So we started managing it, Caitlin and I, my girlfriend back there, raise your hand. <laughs> uh, started managing it. We did it for about three weeks. We got seven five-star reviews in a row. We had three more, uh, two, more. two more listings lined up. We needed one more to get super host, and then the tree dropped on it. Yeah. So, uh, I don't know what's going to happen there. I really just want to turn it into a, an LTR that actually cash flows, but we'll see. So that's why the option's here. Uh, if I turn it into a short-term, or excuse me, long-term rental, I'll, I'll net like 450 a month. If I turn it into a midterm rental, I'll net like 900, but then I feel like I still have to manage it a little bit. So uh, we'll see. I also have like $20,000 worth of furniture in there that, probably $30,000 worth of furniture in there that I don't really know what to do with because it's way too nice for me. So anyways, number one tip for all rentals, integrity. Treat people with respect. Um, treat them like you're your friends, even if they're the most, you know, not friendly people in the world. <laughs> Um, you know, all you can do is be honorable, be consistent, um, and, and you know, be a good person. Be a good, be a good housing provider. Care about your tenants. Care about your guests. And I promise you, you might have a tree drop on you, but it's, it's, it's not you. <laughs> uh, and it, coincidentally, it's also part of the mission of this club: is uh, personal development and integrity of paramount. So, if you took anything I said tonight and you want to go figure out how to screw people over or something, just don't come back here. <laughs> we're trying to, you know, we're trying to, you know, build people that are, build people up that are good people, you know, and network around and, and build a community. So um, if that sounds like you, 
more than welcome to come hang out with us anytime you want. And if you want to contact me, I do wholesale a lot. So every so often, you go to surcashdeals.com. And he's upset, but you know, I gotta pay for the short term rental furniture somehow, so you know. But you can join my buyers list there. Uh, again, my name's Rich, email, phone number, and um, yeah, check me out. And if you wanna do a flip, rental, whatever, you need some advice, um, I'm willing to give advice on systems. I am not tech support though. So even though you may see me running around here doing all the tech support, if you want to hire me to do tech support, Three hundred dollars. <laughs> so, huh? Yeah, yeah. It's probably five hundred if you call the geek squad. So that might be a deal. But, anyways, um, I'll take one question and then I'll pass it off to Bree. How do you find your cleaner? My cleaners. Your cleaners. Right there. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Yeah, I found it nice. Cute, local, <laughs> and I bribed her with food. Turn up, turn up, turn up. I guess there's an app now that you can. Yeah. You can have people place bids. You said on, on yeah. cleaning, so. They will describe the job. Cool. And then, um, place bids on your job. And then you can pick which ones to join your team. You organize like the scheduling. Awesome. Cool. Cool. So check that out. Uh, Bree's coming up next. Brianna Williams, and she's actually she's been designing. She's going to tell you about herself, but she's been designing for years. Uh, she's been focusing on midterm rentals uh, for a while now, and she's also designing uh, the clubhouse. So if you see these designs up all over the place, we're going to take those down. I'm going to put them back up. But there's some in the hallway. You know, she's been designing all the clubhouse, and uh, we're going to use those, and it's going to look really, really cool here. So let's give Bree a round of applause. Hopefully I don't mess this up. <laughs> I missed the memo on following a certain little template that uh, Farah and Rich used, but I think I have something that's at least going to give you tangible takeaways. If you have STRs, MTRs, um, yeah, this should give you something. So, what's MTR? Let's see if I can figure this out. Move forward. Oh, I did it. Okay. <laughs> So um, MTRs are nothing new. I think it's a buzzword now that you're hearing a lot, but it's, they've been around for a long time. You may have heard of them as like temporary housing or corporate housing. Um, there's a lot of different strategies for midterm rentals, but essentially it's just a furnished rental. Utilities are included, you know, Wi-Fi, all the things, um, similar to a short-term rental, but you're renting at a 30-day minimum. Some people will do a 28-day minimum, 30-day minimum is just fine as well. Um, so this, this is a good thing that you might see people start to shift into right now because of all of the restrictions with different cities, counties, what have you, with STRs. If you're, if you're not able to be grandfathered in, or let's just say you bought a property, you go to get your permit, you're not accepted, or you find out, oh shoot, they actually don't allow STRs here, um, instead of illegally operating and having all kinds of bad things happen, you can do an MTR. They don't cash flow as high as STRs, um, but they are better than long-term rentals, typically, like you just saw on um, Rich's numbers breakdown. So the thing about STRs that I would say would help you the most, excuse me, MTRs, um, that helps you the most is determining who your avatar is. So who is renting your unit? Who's rent, who are you looking to reach out to? Because that's going to help determine the success of your rental. It helps determine how much you're able to rent it out for, um, all of that good stuff. So most common, I would say right now, that you're gonna hear about if you're trying to YouTube information or just research or talk, talk to other people, traveling nurses and physicians, Definitely, that's been a market forever. People have been renting furnished rentals to them for a very, very long time, and they're still active. 
there's a little bit of up and down in regards to our hospitals using trauma nurses and they're just not gonna use them again and then they're gonna use them again. Um, but overall, consistently, there are lots of nurses and physicians out there right now that are looking for furnished rentals um, as they travel around the country. So uh, they do get typically a housing allowance and you can go online to a few different websites or you can call hospitals directly and ask what those housing allowances are and that will help determine basically what you should set your prices at if you're looking to market specifically to traveling nurses and physicians. So other people that are gonna look at MTRs uh, digital digital nomads are really popular right now, right? So people who get to work from home now, especially after COVID, a lot of people don't have like permanent residences anymore. I shouldn't say a lot, it's maybe not that many, but um, there are definitely a lot of people out there that are looking for it. So um, essentially for these people particularly, you're going to want to look at what kind of jobs are they doing and you would want to do your due diligence and again just narrowing down who your avatar is who are you marketing this property for because if they have a higher um how should i say this like a higher level of living right like a higher expectation of what they typically have in their houses the qualities that they uh, quality of things that they have like for instance if you go to my parents house you probably will get single ply toilet paper if you go to my house you're not. <laughs> That's probably the one thing that I won't dip down on. <laughs> so, um, so that's just something to think about. Who's going to be staying in the house and how do we furnish it for them specifically? Um, digital, digital nomads, like I said, these are traveling professionals or people who are working from home. So they need to have a, a dedicated workspace. And by dedicated workspace, that doesn't necessarily just mean a desk in the living room where they can set up their laptop, etc. Many times they're going to be traveling with their family, so it could be a spouse, they may have kids, pets, whatever the case may be. And if they need to do Zoom or Google Meetup or Meets or whatever it's called, if they need to do that, you need to make sure that they have a door that they can close, probably that they can lock, because if I tried to do a Zoom in my house and I didn't have a locked door, I'm going to have lots of stuff happening and coming in. And, and it does happen, often. Um, but you want to make sure that you give them that private space for them to actually perform their work. It also helps if you're able to give them like a really cool Zoom background. So in one of the properties that we did, we did like um, paneling all over the walls, built in a, a bed that came down, a mercury bed that came down, and it was all kind of tied into the paneling, so it was kind of invisible, and that really helped um, kind of sell that room. Um, insurance clients, so people who have fires, floods, that kind of thing, who are displaced from their homes, many insurance companies will offer them um, housing, you know, so they'll maybe set them up with like a list and say you could stay here, or, um, or they may have a list of specific short-term rentals, mid-term rentals in the area, so you can actually market through them as well. Uh, many times they'll actually pay, insurance companies will probably pay out a little bit higher than your gener general people on Airbnb or VRBO or something like that. Um, so you also have healthcare patients. So yes, you have healthcare physicians, but also healthcare patients. So the, the property that I'm currently managing, um, I've been contacted by several people who are uh, patients for the cancer institution that's in Irvine. So they have to travel when they do their their treatments and such, and many times they're traveling from hours away, two, three hours away, and they have treatments Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., and so it just makes sense for them to stay local and then maybe travel home on the weekends, and so they'll rent out for a month or two months or whatever the case may be. Uh, patients, I'm sorry, uh, students, so if you're near a university, students are a great way to um, a great kind of avatar to market to as well. If you're going to market to students, you probably don't need a lot in your rental, but you're also not going to charge as much. So again, there's so many different options. This is honestly such a small, tiny little thing. So just a little bit of what you can find out there. But if you can pick that person, you have them in your head, it makes it a lot easier to design your space with intention um, and really market it for them. Then when they see your listing come across, they're going to go, whoa, they thought of this and this, and this, and it has everything I need, I, I gotta stay here. 
Um, and I do get that often. So as far as where you can list um, for midterm rentals, you can list on Airbnb. And actually Airbnb has been pushing a little bit more of the longer term stays. I think they actually have a section of their website that is specifically for long term stays if people are searching for that. So you can definitely do that. I would say if you're targeting more of the luxury market, Airbnb is where you want to go because Furnish Finder is not the caliber of homes that you're going to find on Furnish Finder are not quite as high as what you find on Airbnb. If you are able to run STR in the location where your home is, it's also nice to list it on Airbnb and you know kind of build your listing on that platform with your reviews, super host status, whatever the case may be, and that will. Um, help you rent out not only long term, but sometimes you have somebody that checks out on May 7th and the next person wants to check in on May 14th and now you have a week. If you are stuck in a place where you can only rent 30 days plus, that week you are going to be vacant. So that's something to consider when you're thinking of midterm rentals. However, if you can run SDRs, then that's a great opportunity to stick in somebody short term and you can maybe give a little bit of a discount to incentivize booking that time and then you don't have that vacancy. So Airbnb is good for that. VRBO, same thing. Furnish Finder is um, more traditionally for travel nurses, travel healthcare professionals. Um, there's also travelnursehousing.com, which is operated by Furnish Finder. Um, and again, those are gonna be travel nurses. Travel nurses typically are not looking for a lot in their spaces. They really need a great bed. They absolutely need blackout curtains probably a good sound machine because many of them will end up working nights and they'll work 24 hour shifts again and again and again. And then they have, you basically they're just coming home, they're sleeping and then they're going back to work. They're trying to maximize how much money they're able to make when they're traveling and they're away from their families, their homes, whatever the case may be. So just keep that in mind if you're going to, go, you're going to market specifically to travel nurses. So there's a lot of places that you can list specifically for them, um, but you're going to want to, I don't want to say you put in the bare minimum, you want quality, but you don't need to go above and beyond with the design for that particular avatar. Just know that you're going to take maybe a little bit less on the um, overall listing price. Um, so these are kind of fun. Zillow, I think Rich mentioned, he lists his long-term rental on Zillow. You can list month to month on Zillow as well. And he's accurate. They'll also post it on um, Hot pads, Trulia. I want to say there's one other one that I can't think of. Um, so that's kind of nice. And they will screen the tenants for you. So if you are going midterm rental, Airbnb is nice because they're going to prepay for the most part. Or if they're, excuse me, if they're on the month to month, they'll prepay for their first month. And then Airbnb will automatically charge them for each month after that. And they pay you out month by month. Um, so that's how they do their longer term stays. So uh, with Furnish Finder, they don't book, they, they, they can request dates through Furnish Finder, but ultimately you're going to send them a lease. So you're going to send them a month-to-month -month lease, a three-month lease, a six-month lease, whatever you want to do. Um, and you will be responsible for the screening and all the things. So some of the things that he just put up there are really good resources for MTRs as well. And then you have home ads. Homeads.com is a place for people to find housing when they are digital nomads. So that's a good one to try if you are um, specifically targeting digital nomads. And then of course, like I said, you have insurance agencies, corporate housing agencies, healthcare agencies, etc. You can call the hospitals directly, you can call the insurance companies directly, ask them which agencies they work with, and then you can go on from there. A lot of those agencies won't list just one property. So you'll need to have three, four, or five properties before they're even gonna consider listing you. So that's just something to know. Um, you'll have to build that up before you can just call up an insurance agency and say, hey, I want your people to come to my house. Um, so just kind of plan for that in advance. So probably could go on and on about midterm rentals. I think there's a lot of things that are similar to short-term rentals. Um, so many of the like softwares and websites that Rich had mentioned are going to be valuable for midterm rentals as well. Um, but today we're going to look at essentially the top five mistakes that I see when I do property audits. 
So when I do a property audit for a short-term rental or a mid-term rental, I walk through the house or I will look through the listing or both and I kind of determine areas of um, uh, like opportunity for improvement. So this is what I find most common that's just super easy to fix. And if you have short-term rentals, <laughs> I know, it, it sounds so like intuitive. Duh, you would clean before you take the photos, right? But sometimes you delegate that task to somebody else and maybe they're not so careful with um, <laughs> prepping the space like you maybe. Uh, but you would be surprised how many listings you can pull up and find stuff like this. Products all over the bathroom counter, dishes all over the kitchen counters, uh, sink full of dirty dishes, beds that are not made. I get it, more than likely, <laughs> a cleaner probably took the photos in between guests or something changed and they needed to snap a quick photo. Um, but it's just, it's, it, it really goes far if you can take the time to properly stage for the photography. And I mean, go out and buy a bouquet of flowers and put them on the table, set up a glass of wine or a cup of coffee, those kinds of things, those lifestyle shots will help people visualize living in the space and it's going to make them more attracted to the listing. Uh, so space is not designed with intention. I think the two on your right, my left, can be kind of obvious. Um, so older furniture, or maybe furniture that's been repurposed, where it's clearly not intended for that use, like the, the photo on the bottom. Um, clearly that's a wine rack, and you can see all of the cords, and it's maybe just not the most aesthetically pleasing. Uh, those are pretty obvious, but the one on your left, that looks like a nice room. Their bench is cute. They clearly decorated it with some thought, but here's what I have to say about the intention of the space. So, the shelf over the bed, while there's intention there, I mean, there was thought there, I should say, it's not very intentional because this particular unit, it's just a one room, and with midterm rentals, you can um, kind of house hack, uh, like Farrah was saying, so you can do just one room within a house. You can have a five bedroom house and you can do five individual listings that are all furnished, um, or you can do a whole home. This happens to be just this one room. They're renting just the one room and it's for two people. My thing is, if there's two people in the full size bed, one person's up against the wall, which is fine, but if that person tries to sit up, they're gonna hit their head on that shelf. And God forbid there's an earthquake in the middle of the night, that is a lot of stuff that's gonna come down on those people and that's a lot of liability. So even, I don't think, I don't think there's enough earthquake pity in the world that's gonna get all that stuff to stay put if there's um, an earthquake. So that's just something to think about when you are setting up your listing. Um, think through it, have a plan, and really kind of go through exactly how the guest is gonna be using the space. So this is actually something that um, I think Rich talked a little bit about short-term rentals, and you would be surprised how many times I've walked in and there's been no cleaning audit. One of the property audits that I performed recently, just the end of last year, um, I walked in two hours after the cleaners had left following a guest stay, and um, I said, you know, don't be, don't be offended, but I'm gonna do my due diligence to see how your cleaners did. Well, I had already seen cobwebs in the corner. I actually saw a spider in the corner, just kind of chilling in its web. Um, and so little things like that, if I walk into a property that I'm staying at and I see a spider in the corner, I'm like, oh boy, what are we gonna find here? Oh, um, like. What's that? No flies. <laughs> no flies. I mean, they may, there may be flies, they may be dead, they may be in the web. That, that's possible, but, um, but yeah, that's accurate. Um, and so what I had already kind of gathered was that nobody was auditing the cleaners. The cleaners were kind of starting to get away with a little more than they maybe should have. So what I did in the bathroom was I reached up on the top shelf and I ran my finger along the top and sure enough, it was caked with dust which means that it probably hadn't been cleaned in a while, and this is in the only bathroom in the unit. So, not ideal. There was, um, on the top of the door jams, it was really thick and dusty and gross. So these are all the little things that you have to make sure that you're keeping track of. And I'm not saying you have to check every single time somebody cleans, but you do want to check at least quarterly. Just make sure that the cleaners are doing what they're supposed to be doing. And a good cleaning checklist goes a long way. 
because you can actually tell them, look at a wall, left to right, top to bottom, what needs to be done. Yeah? What do you charge for cleaning up? This particular property, uh, the cleaner charges 150, um, new cleaner. Cleaner charges 150, and the cleaning fee on Airbnb is listed at 200. Your what is your audit? Oh yes, my audit is 500. And it typically takes around two hours. But like I said, I do dig into the entire listing um, to determine areas of opportunity within the listing, whether that's photography, copyright, are we really showcasing all the amenities of the neighborhood, things like that. Um, I usually do my due diligence when I drive out to the property and I'll try to visit local eateries, let's just say. I'm a foodie, so that's kind of like, if I'm gonna rent an Airbnb, I wanna know what's around. Whether that's a coffee shop, a bar, just kind of like a little secret spot. Um, one of the ones that I did recently at the park, they always have food trucks every day from a certain hour to a certain hour, but they tend to park on different sides of the park. So if you're not from the area, you might not know that they, where to look for them. So that was kind of fun. And it wasn't in their, guess, their guidebook. So that's a, a, an important thing to include. So cleaning audits for sure. And home maintenance. So I think another thing that maybe Rich mentioned? Fair? Somebody said something about home maintenance. But not maintaining your property is a killer. And with long, or excuse me, midterm rentals, you might have somebody stay for six months, you might have somebody stay for nine months, and you don't know how they're taking care of your property. So I would advise having at least a quarterly cl cleaning um, mandatory in your lease. So if they're staying over 90 days, you're going to mandatory require a cleaning during the middle of their stay. Um, just to keep up on some of the maintenance things. So same property. They had a tenant who stayed for nine months and very clearly did not keep up the property very well. A lot of things were damaged and ruined. Um, and more specifically, the showers, uh, he must have taken really hot showers, I'm not really sure, but everything in the bathroom was rusted. The bathroom was recently renovated. The light fixture was rusted. The exhaust, the little exhaust, the edge of the exhaust fan were rusted. The drains were rusted out. The entire tub was ruined. <laughs> So it's just, and again, that could have been avoided if somebody was going in and somebody was cleaning this at least every 90 days, right? I mean, it, it might even be beneficial to pay for a cleaner, just include it in your, in your rent. You can charge a higher rental, a uh, monthly rent, and just include a cleaner that's gonna come in either bi-weekly or maybe like once a month or something like that. Um, just, you'd be surprised how often I see that people don't keep up with the maintenance on MTRs. Um, and then your listing. So the best way to get a five-star review, regardless of whether it's on VRBO, Airbnb, or Furnish Finder, the best way by far is to set the best expectations. Let them know up front. If you have a tiny closet, tell them that the closet is tiny. They need to know what they're getting into before they get there and go to unpack their clothes and say, oh, I can't hang any of my clothes because this closet is so tiny. So just let them know what's realistic. Um, and also don't overpromise. <laughs> if anything, underpromise. Underpromise and overdeliver. So the below description states that it's a historic home, it's one of a kind, it's a grandeur home. This is like a super tiny home in San Bernardino. Like really tiny. There's nothing grandeur about it. And if I'm from Tennessee or Texas, I'm not gonna know that especially if you're from Texas, where everything is bigger. You're gonna walk into this tiny 800 square foot house that has like eight foot ceilings and be like, what is happening? This is not grandeur. And the only thing that was, I would say, uh, historic about the home was all of the antiques that were in it, or really just like the old furniture that was in the property. So they had tried to renovate it, and so the kitchen felt more modern. The bathroom felt more modern, but, um, you know, everything else was kind of outdated. So not a great description. Definitely one that I probably would have been a little disappointed had I, had I gone out there. And then also centrally located in Orange County between LA and San Diego. Kind of makes you feel like you're maybe a little bit closer to LA or San Diego. And um, <laughs> does not really tell you? That's like when the people say, oh, we're five miles away from Disneyland. 
but with traffic, that five miles can take you 40 minutes to get there. <laughs> and people from out of state don't know that because they don't know the 91 freeway. So, um, <laughs> so people can say, hey, I'm getting this great place. It's a great deal. It's only five miles away from Disneyland. We should just hop, skip, and jump away. And then they get out there, they check in, they go to drive to Disneyland, and their kids are screaming, are we there yet? For 45 minutes. And ta-da, you have a pretty crappy review. So just set the expectation at the get-go. If you explain to them right away, like, yeah, we're with traffic, it, it might take you a little bit of time. And that doesn't necessarily have to be in your listing, but it does have to be communicated to them before they book. Everybody's going to request to book before they actually book in most cases. So, you know, just be open and honest. And that is it. Those are the biggest mistakes that I see time and time and time again. Um, that are so, so easy to fix. So hopefully that's tangible and you can take away um, all of that. And then if you do have an STR or you're planning to do an STR, at least you know what to avoid and what you can fix. Oh, uh, and yes, um, this is my phone number. You'll probably see it better on this side. So phone number, email, Instagram. This side, phone number, email, and Instagram. And this scanned me. I am actually, um, doing a survey right now just to, just to kind of dig in a little bit um, into how much people spend when they're furnishing SDRs and MTRs. How much do they spend on design? How much do they spend on furniture? And what's the ROI of that? So let's get real numbers to tell us if we spend more on the design, does it actually help us? Is it worth it? And I will be completely honest and I will give you the actual results. So if you can scan that, the Survey should take like three minutes. It's really short and really easy. And that's it. Yay. A little longer. I got so little. It's Rich's fault. I'm kidding. I, I talked a long time too. Oh, that's fine. Um, do you want to come back up? Because I know there was more questions for Rich. I don't know if anyone had questions for Bree as well. Yeah, I have questions. You had a question for her? Yeah, well, I was, oh. Brady, I was curious. Like you said, you mentioned uh, that you do something specific for, like, if you were to target like nurses. Uh -huh. So, if you were to target nurses, I guess I'm curious how you target nurses. Like, what do you think you put? Like nurse paraphernalia in the house? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have. Yeah. Costco had some really great deals on anatomy books, and they were kind of cool looking. So I did actually decorate the inside of a of an entertainment unit with with anatomy books. Um, but yeah. then we found out What's that anatomy, book? anatomy, anatomy books? books, anatomy books, anatomy, anatomy. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like the white books. Those those things that nurses like. I don't really know. Um, <laughs> not not in a creepy way. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so that, I mean, no, you don't necessarily have to do that. In fact, what I would recommend is if you're going to do anything in terms of like thematic, I would actually just play off of the area that you're in. So if you're in the desert, play off of something desert related. If you're in the mountains, uh, maybe like, you know, include a lot of like hiking trails in their guidebooks. That kind of stuff is going to go a lot further. Recommendations with nurses are going to go a lot further than, let's just say, the design. The design doesn't hurt. I have, you know, a really cool unit. As a matter of fact, it's a unit that's up here now that has this really cool wall of wallpaper, um, massive wall. That's more or less our hero shot, not this one, the one with the wallpaper in it. And um, I do get, I do get um, contacted by nurses frequently. I'm like, wow, that, that's a really cool place. They really want to, really want to rent it. But it's probably about fifteen hundred dollars too high for the travel nurse market. So. Frequently, they they tend to pass. A lot of people ask for discounts, but um, it's not really something that we do. So um, and we stay booked. Um, so when you're when you're targeting the nurses, I would say, like I said earlier, go to bed. The reviews are going to prove that it's a good bed. Quality linens, anything that's going to help them get a good night's sleep, a good coffee bar, travel mugs, maybe multiple travel mugs. A smoothie blender, like a, the individual smoothie blenders where they can just pop the lid on it and go, um, like a magic bullet or something like that. That's going to be a nice little touch for them. Um, and anything that just makes their day to day a little bit easier. Um, it wouldn't hurt to actually include like a lunch pail and ice packs. 
so that they can make their lunch or, or offer an add-on service like meal prep so they can have meals delivered on Monday morning. They can keep them in the fridge or in the freezer and then they can take them to work with them. That's, that's something that you can offer them as well. So it's more for them, it's going to be more about the experience than it is about the actual design and furnishings. But it doesn't hurt to still make the space look good. <laughs> and, and I, just from videos I see on your Instagram, what other like special touches do you do? Like, like folding towels, for example? <laughs> Bear says this because we've uh, sent each other pictures on how um, particular we are about folding towels. I, <laughs> I chose to actually begin co-hosting some of my designs, my designs and only my designs, but because I'm super, I like to micromanage, <laughs> and I'm really particular about the way that I set certain things up. So when I full service design and I fully set up a property, um, I fold the linens a very particular way. I, little tip, I save all of the clear zippered bags that your sheets and bedding come in, and when the sheets are cleaned, I fold them nice and neat, you can go to my, my uh, Instagram and watch the video of how I pulled a bit of sheet, uh, fold it nice and neat, tuck everything into one little pocket and slide it into that clear bag, zip it up so it stays clean and doesn't get all dusty and musty, and I put it inside nice um, like fabric tokens, slide them into the closets, etc. So yeah, those are all the little touches that I do when I set up a unit. Um, it's just what I do with my with my house too. It's just I guess it's just second nature for me. Um, organizing the pantry, take everything out of the boxes and out of the jars and put them into clear jars, things like that. That's what helps uh, helps take a property from just a property to a luxury property. So just a, every little thing that you can try to think of, try to think of it. Go through one day and just I have checklists too that I can put out online. Or call you. Oh yeah, you can absolutely call me. There's my phone number and my email. I have a question. Yes, you, your question. How, how do you determine if, if, for example, my market is not oversaturated? I know that's been a big question that we got, specifically for short-term rentals, mm -hmm. but I had an idea of doing mid-term rentals just because I know a lot of people from the hospital from where I'm from. Mm -hmm. But I have done the, the furnish finder route that people recommend, and I don't know if I'm doing it wrong, but I see very, very cheap rents. Yes, I agree. Furnish finder, your rents are going to be really low. Something new that I've never noticed before, um, I frequently will go in and when I do my own market research on a property to determine what really it should be listed for, yeah. um, I use both Airbnb and Furnish finder for midterm rentals when I'm kind of doing some of that market research on pricing. But what I would say is Furnish finder they have this little gauge where it's like, what are you willing to spend? And like 3,200 is the max that it went to. They just changed that to 10,000. I just saw that this morning. It says up to 10,000 now. So I think Furnish Finder is understanding that more people are trying to put some luxury into the midterm market. They're also understanding now that it's not just travel nurses, um, which I don't know if travel nurse housing is relatively new, but I recently heard about that, like within the last week or so, the travel nurse, travelnursehousing.com. Um, so I don't know if they're trying to just like separate that out a little bit or still give them their own platform. Um, Furnishedfinder.com slash stats will help you to determine how many searches are in your area and how many listings are in your area so you can see how that supply and demand is going in that particular area. Um, and then and you can always still look at like AirDNA and those types of things. I like to look at it all and then I kind of average it out. Is that something that you offer as a service or not? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, on your property audit, that's something that we would discuss. That's so we would, a $500 charge. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we would look at it and you walk away. So your property audit, I actually provide a full spreadsheet of things like actual items that you can complete on your own and you can just DIY that. One more quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, one bedroom against two, what do you recommend? I would say two bedrooms. So if you're looking for, if you're looking to target nurses specifically, one bedroom, one bathroom is totally fine. Two bedroom, two bath opens up now families. Um, when Rich was talking, I got a booking request um, for our Garden Grove condo, and it's a family. It's a, he's a healthcare professional, but he's traveling with his wife and their infant. So they might want a second room just to kind of get away, especially if he's trying to sleep and the baby's crying and he needs to, you know, so now he doesn't have to sleep on the couch. But also just in general, there's been a lot of requests for families and things like that. Can you take a few more questions? Um, it has something to do with taxes, because um, 
short-term rentals, we normally uh, declare them to the city. So we have to fill out the TLT every month, right? And does that apply with MTR as well? And I don't know how that works with federal taxation then. Because if we have to pay already monthly to the city, do we have to pay federal again? Because so we're, not, we're not tax professionals, so I'll just disclaim that real quick. Um, but the, typically, no, like with the NTR stuff, there's not the income reporting and the, a lot of the stuff that's required for short term rentals. Um, so that's something that she's, you know, is nice for those. Um, how it all breaks down into your, your taxes is a whole different discussion. We, I, we don't have time. But it's uh, you, you can run your short term rental like as a business, you can run it as uh, with like, you know, uh, oh, I forgot the term for it. Um, cost segregation, you can do, you can run it as a full-on like company. You can also run it under your personal, you have a lot of options there. But again, that's a whole, that's a whole thing. Um, we only got a couple more minutes, so. Uh, I think that you pay federal again after paying monthly to the city, is it? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Exactly. That applies to everything. The feds want their cut. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you credit, do any Right. Most short terms require a rental license. Most long term rentals require a license. Mid term is kind of in that gray area right now. So, what's that? Mid term requires business license too. It depends on the city. Right. I don't know. My mine aren't in cities, so the county just requires a, a rental term or rental permit. Sorry. Um, Caitlin, I have a question. Oh, I was just wondering, Ray, since you the higher end. Rental? Who are you marketing to then? Is it like contractors or? For this specific one, this was going to be traveling, working professionals or working professionals who are traveling with a small family. Okay. Okay. Yes. However, like I mentioned earlier, we've had a lot of booking requests um, for the cancer center in Irvine for our patients. The one caveat to that is our rental is on a second floor and many cancer patients are unable to you know, deal with the stairs. Um, our current guest is kind of in that boat, but what we did was we actually put a nice seating area right at the top of the stairs. So after her first day or two, um, that was just something that I instantly offered. We need something for you then to rest before you go inside. So we just, I just went out and got a nice chair, plant, pillow, set it up cute and, and helped her that way. And I think we had a question if you need, if you need the license, right? Um, specifically permits. No, most most locations that I know of do not require permits for anything over 28 days. Um, but definitely check with the city before you invest in anything and before you really kind of dive right in. And I've actually called the city a few times in, in events for like I'm just a little iffy. Maybe the wording isn't super clear, specifically for midterm rentals. So I've called and I've generally had pretty, pretty good success with just having, you know, catching somebody on a good day. They've been nice. <laughs> They'll give me some some feedback, and um, so that doesn't hurt. Yeah, Christy, did you stop the question for Rich? No. Okay. okay. All right. We probably have one more question. Chat GPT. How do you, how do you use that in your? Can you explain that a little bit more? Uh, I think it's free. You get a certain amount of like responses for free, but you can pay for it. Uh, it's like twenty bucks. How much did I pay? Twenty bucks a month. Was it? Right. I thought it was cheaper than that. I was like, it was like 80 like, bucks for a year or something. Sounds, yeah, really? Like, yeah. Whatever it is, it's freaking worth it. I so, um, use it. Yeah, so you just, you just basically like, um, the easiest thing would do to be like, take existing listings that you have, for example, and just copy and paste it and say, hey, uh, I mean, you can talk to this thing like you're having a conversation. Um, you just say, hey, take this and optimize it for Airbnb. So it's just in the descriptions. That's pretty much all you use it for. The listening um, description. I'm lonely, I ask a question. But it's uh, like, uh, no, you can ask all kinds of stuff. You can, I've asked it like, you know, I had something with uh, Excel the other day where I was trying to get a link to, to add to the end of some other cell. Um, and I felt like I knew what I was doing, but I clearly didn't. And so I asked Chad, I was like, how do I, Take this and this and do this, and it gave me like a whole thing. And it's like it's like Google without like the results that you got to go dig for. Like it's it's giving and all this stuff that they put at the top now. That's 
worthless. And so it's and so just, and Google just put in chat GPT. Yeah, yeah they have a version there. I think it's Bard yeah. or something. Just be, be uh, extremely careful. Because yeah. I was playing with it this weekend, mm -hmm. and I got my email hacked and my Facebook hacked. And there's, wow. because it's fairly new, there's a bunch. It's not just Chat GPT. There's a bunch of websites. You yeah. can you can come up with images. You can do yeah. uh, editing. So there's a bunch of websites. Make they make sure it's a legit website because the second I sign for one of them. Yeah. yeah, be very careful like who you said it's, it's so it's openai.com it's and there that's the legit chat GPT one. There's a lot of clones out there that are trying to fish and, and get stuff. But for when it comes to real estate, uh, I think it's very powerful for li writing listings, maybe writing copy for uh, you know deal machine mailers, uh, marketing pieces, your websites, uh, social bios. You know, yes, yeah, so yeah, yep, writing, you know, uh, I told it to, um, like for the club, for example, I told it to, uh, for exchangers, I told it to, I, I basically like re had to rewrite the exchanger email that goes out every week. And then I told it to break that up into 20 different variations of, to post on Instagram with the, these six hashtags at the end of it. And it literally within 45 seconds gave me 20 different variations with all the, with everything ready to go that I could just copy and paste. Time saver. Yeah, now I just need some, another thing to do, like to make 20 different images to put on, <laughs> on Instagram. And then, you know, eventually it'll just post it for me and I don't, I, don't, I, I can go to the Bahamas again. So. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I think that's all we have for questions. We're gonna stick around for like another half hour. I'll let you wrap it up, so. Yeah, so like I said earlier, um, we're gonna be doing this monthly. Every first Wednesday we'll be talking about some type of rental topic. Um, next month, Stephanie Figueros, she will be here talking about STRs. So her fan club over here, you better be here. <laughs> Stephanie's fan club, who else is in Stephanie's fan club? <laughs> Ooh, yeah, so <laughs> she'll be here talking all about STRs. She is, she would have been here today, but I guess she liked Ryan Pineda a little bit better. I mean, no, I'm kidding. But, uh, <laughs> So that'll be next month, and then we'll dive deep into other topics um, as we go forward. Just check meetup.com, and you'll see what we're doing going forward. Oh, and next week, we're, oh, they have another here. Did she? Oh, okay. Well, Evan's not here, but um, Evan and um, Jim Keller will be, Evan Brown and Jim Keller are doing uh, flipping wholesaling next Wednesday and then the Wednesday after that Mr. Goodwin, Mr. Andy over there will be doing creative financing be there or be square <laughs> it's the same stuff in exchangers but probably on steroids I, I mean I kind of I what that man has in his head this guy like just be here so um, same with all of them but yeah tomorrow and we have exchangers tomorrow, tomorrow. yes yeah, so there's a there's a line. So yes, tomorrow, um, every Thursday, unless it's a holiday or I'm in Cancun and Rich is snowed in, um, we are here in person every Thursday, 12 to 2. So um, we solved that problem. But we still have Zoom that week, even though we were looked fantastic. <laughs> so he was snowed in with 80 of snow, and I was in Cancun in the sun. 80 degrees. Are we going to go through the network for a Yeah. You, you guys want to hang out a little bit? We don't, uh, I don't think Rich is taking this out. <laughs> so yeah, just mingle if you guys have more questions. Do you want to hear about how I lost all that money? Um, we get it. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.